Uh, we'll go ahead uh, with the next panel. Uh, so if you could uh, go up and take your places. Well, good afternoon. Um, in, the, in the program, we have um, five student representatives uh, listed. I wonder if they would um, sit here so they can become instantly engaged. Uh, Jacob Berlin, Laura Gibson, Ashley Leonard, uh, Patrick uh, Maloney, and Ronke Alibisi. Please um, come to the front. Well, that's a pretty tough act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> it really, um, actually, as Jeff said, it's, it's a very good introduction because it shows how programs do change. Please. <coughs> it, it shows how programs uh, change with time and how we have to adapt with it and how education is an important part of it. I'd like to kind of bring out one other contrast from those days, and that is that today there are 44 nations that own or operate satellites. In those days you had a handful of nations that were involved, and that really changes the dynamic. If you look at the original nations that were involved in space activity, they were first generation at that time, now we're at the end of second generation, third generation of people going through the system. Many of the nations that are joining the programs now, they're still in the first generation. So to some extent, they're a reflection of the sort of thing that uh, Glenn was talking about, young people with initiatives. And as we talk about international cooperation and the growth of some of those nations, how do their drivers fit with our drivers? How does that cooperation uh, occur. One of the other aspects is that because we are towards the end of that second generation in the developed world, there's a large number of people who are eligible to retire from the workforce, whether it's in government or in the uh, private sector. And timing, of course, depends on their desire to retire, but it does mean that there will be a need in the spacefaring nations uh, that have a longer history to replenish those um, resources. Well, this panel has been constructed to address a number of the issues that are involved in education, um, educating people who will be attracted to the field, who hopefully will have stimulating opportunities and um, how can they get their progression? How can we make a fit for their first job with the uh, private sector or the government um, people? Uh, what, is, what is needed? What can we add uh, to this um, debate or question that's been going on now in many nations for years? So I'm very pleased uh, that we have a panel with a cross-section of backgrounds a cross-section of nations that they come from, um, a cross-section of universities that they uh, represent. Uh, and so I'm very pleased to start right off now with Ludmila Burakova, IMP, um, IBMP Scientific Secretary uh, from Russia. Thank you very much, Carl, and thanks for the possibility to participate in uh, this great meeting. Uh, at the beginning of my short talking, I would like to uh, mention that, in my mind, uh, education as process uh, has two main goals. Uh, one of them is uh, dissemination of knowledge, without any examination, just dissemination. And uh, another very important goal is teaching and training uh, of the next or new generation of uh, specialists. Uh, I would like to draw uh, your attention to the uh, second goal. It's near um, to me uh, because uh, I am head of uh, postgraduate department in our institute, and I am also the professor of Moscow State University. 
three days ago here in United States, I have saw uh, the picture in USA Today in Hilton. Uh, running man and uh, two berries on uh, his way. Low level berry for education and high level barrier for job. Uh, I think uh, that the levels of uh, barrier depends on kind of education and uh, the kind of job. Uh, I could suggest that uh, the barrier for education in Rice University is very high, as I know. Uh, so the level of job barrier depends on uh, first requirements of employer, uh, salary for um, position, and ambitions of young scientists or young specialists. Uh, increase uh, the value of these parameters uh, will uh, lead to rise of barrier level. So uh, our institute has a special agreement uh, with uh, two faculty of Moscow State University and with two technical universities, al also Moscow Aviation Institute and Moscow Institute of Physics. Uh, so we could uh, teach students and we could involve uh, the students to our uh, project. Our specialists uh, involved in lectures, seminars, and uh, we try to involve uh, students during experimental uh, diploma investigation and also after uh, the uh, end of the institute. And during education, we try to draw attention, draw uh, um, students' attention to the problems of space medicine. And then we try to involve them to participation in the real project and real investigation. And then we make a, a choice as employer. And uh, in my mind, it is an optimal situation. Uh, and uh, when we place the announcement of postgraduate education in field of space medicine or physiology on our website, many students uh, visit our institute uh, to understand more exactly uh, about uh, possibility the investigation and of course possibility of uh, job. Uh, and each year we invite 10 or 15 uh, postgraduate students in our institute for uh, these special three years uh, courses. Uh, the young scientist starts the PhD education and at the same time they start their job in our institute according temporary contract. I think it's a good way uh, when a scientist, PhD student, could, uh, could understand uh, not only, uh, I could say, free investigation, but also uh, they could understand the responsibility for the uh, um, part of the uh, project. And uh, I uh, think uh, that uh, also is uh, the first stage to training uh, when uh, head of department or head of the project together with a PhD scientist carried out special uh, investigation. It's the best way to evaluate the uh, capability of young scientists uh, and during involving them uh, to the real uh, project. And they should try to compare uh, their ambitious and real possibility. Uh, the level of, of training and knowledge, uh, their responsibility for result, results and for mistakes, uh, and also the skills for the team work. Uh, 
uh, one month ago, the scientist journal uh, published, uh, I think, very good idea. Try uh, to include uh, PhD students to peer review. Uh, for uh, also knowledge and also understanding peer review as part of the investigation. Uh, so uh, I think it this during my uh, short talk, uh, I, I would like to mention once more again that uh, the uh, student education and uh, postgraduate education is uh, very important for uh, both of side, for employer and for student. And both sides could make uh, a choice. Employer make a choice and student uh, make a choice. And uh, also, uh, maybe short, Carl, I would li like to mention that uh, right now, in this period of time, is very important um, our international cooperation in education. Uh, like, um, for example, summer school, like participation of young scientists is a special prize during um, many uh, congress, uh, many uh, symposium, many meetings. And I would like uh, all of us could help a uh, new generation to, uh, to be with us and to change us, uh, in, uh, to make job with us, to make project uh, with us, and then uh, do this work, work uh, by yourself. Well, thank you very thank much, uh, Ludmilla. Um, <coughs> here we're talking about ensuring that the students have the experience as they're being educated to best suit them for their potential uh, careers, uh, so they have a good understanding. I'll turn now to um, Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Dunbar, um, astronaut and the president of the Washington State Aerospace Scholars. President of the Washington State Aerospace Scholars. Thank you, Carl. Uh, well, I'm also the, uh, the president of the Museum of Flight, and so I'm looking at a different part of a pipeline. And it's a, a pipeline uh, situation which exists primarily in North America and Europe and not so much in Asia right now. And that's how we inspire and grow our K through 12 youth to uh, take the appropriate amount of science in school and mathematics so that they can go into the universities and study the subjects that we need to help go into the future in uh, space and whether it's in engineering or in science uh, or in medicine. And I came about uh, to this position actually through uh, my last two positions at NASA and of course interacting with the schools um, as in my former life as an astronaut. Uh, I worked uh, for Mr. Abbey as the Assistant Director for University Research and Affairs for several years and it became very apparent to me in working down in the universities that even the, my home departments at the University of Washington were struggling to find qualified engineering students. And even those students who were interested were coming out of high school without being properly prepared in mathematics and in science. And now back in Washington State, as in many states across our, our nation, uh, we're facing similar problems. And it starts first with that inspiration as to uh, what gets me into science and engineering, and then the teachers who will help support that or parents, and then having the teachers that can properly teach the subject. Well, as a museum, we are now classified as what's called informal education by the federal government. Up until three years ago, we weren't even qualified to apply for grants. And yet, the reason I'm at the Museum of Flight is that I had been on the board before, and we have the largest K-12 through educational program of any air and space museum in the nation, including the Smithsonian. I have 16 educators on staff. Uh, they. Uh, reach about 120,000 youth in Washington State every year and we have four traveling vans so we can make it to the uh, Indian reservations or the far parts of, of the state. This is not a undocumented or new status in terms of inspiring our youth. Uh, starting back in 1987 with the National Science Foundation indicators, we started to see declines in engineering enrollment and then most recently the National Academy of Engineers put out their pivotal report uh, called Rising Above the Gathering Storm and talking about this as a threat to our future uh, in terms of uh, 
both our, our intellectual capital as well as an e economic uh, uh, challenge as well. So we're focused on solutions, and we work directly with the schools. We directly work directly with the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. All of our content are not classified as field trips. They're actually uh, aligned with the state academic standards, and we do a lot of follow-up. And one of the programs that we did migrate from Texas, a very successful program which was started by Mr. Abbey, was the Texas Aerospace Scholars. We entered into a Space Act agreement with NASA to uh, bring that to Washington State. It's now called the Washington Aerospace Scholars. And it's a very successful program for juniors throughout the state, very competitive, uh, includes uh, 10 academic online uh, uh, internet lessons in Mars exploration, which is prepared by NASA. The students take these lessons, and then out of the number enrolled, we select 160 to come to the museum during the summer in groups of 40. And these students divide into four teams, and they design a mission to Mars. So what do we hear from the students? Well, first of all, we've self-selected those students uh, that are qualified already in math and science because we want them to work along with scientists and engineers. We have uh, great, robust middle school programs for uh, you know, the 12-year-olds and the 13-year-olds. We have a Challenger Learning Center, for example. But it was for those uh, youth who had all the academics but were choosing careers completely outside of science and engineering, for example, law, that we were trying to reintroduce back into engineering. What we hear from them is how excited they were about working with scientists and engineers to design these missions to Mars. And they did not know that the careers that took them to that in real life included engineering. They hadn't heard that from their high school counselor, or physics, or math, or chemistry, uh, or medicine. Many of them didn't know that medical doctors could be involved in human spaceflight, for example, or researchers involved in human physiology and cell uh, biology. So we've introduced that vocabulary back to them, and we're making a difference because we can track them. They are now entering, in, we're in our fourth year, entering into the universities in Washington State in those academic um, areas. So as we look at our, our programs, and we have an outside advisory board, and look at the metrics, I think we've all identified the problem in, in North America and in Europe. Uh, we all have found point solutions. But the challenge now is finding, uh, I think, both inspiration as well as very high level, in our case, national uh, direction and leadership. I just came from a two-day conference uh, in Washington, D.C. called Inside Aerospace, and this is exactly what we talked about for two days. It was sponsored by the AIAA. Many great programs across the country, not integrated and not well-funded. I'm here looking out at you because of one funded program during Apollo called the National Defense Education Act. It sent me to college with a full grant and loan to study engineering because I grew up on a cattle ranch in eastern Washington. No one had been to college in my family, uh, couldn't afford it, but I was inspired by Sputnik and I was inspired by President Kennedy speaking at this university in 1962 and being shown on a black and white television that we were able to borrow. So I think that we need uh, to take it to a next level if we're going to have a pipeline in North America and Europe. Uh, look at the excitement that space is uh, providing the youth in Asia, uh, that we see many, many uh, wonderful programs coming from. And uh, that's why I'm back at a museum uh, looking at that pipeline. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bonnie, for describing this um, important and effective bridge and uh, talking about the need for integrated solution. Kevin, um, you represent a nation that has been powerful in space, uh, not a nation, but you come from a nation, um, but hasn't supported human spaceflight uh, very much of late. What are your thoughts? <coughs> yeah, um, well... So, I mean, the UK is infamous for being the only G8 nation that doesn't support a national program of astronautics. Uh, and those of you in the room who know me know that it is my mission in life to try and get this country to re-engage, which I've been at for some 10 years now. So uh, uh, there's a horrifying fraction of people in the room who've helped me in that over the years. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your charity. Um, 
I should say that things have changed. Actually, the first conference I held in which we uh, engaged the senior levels of government in science, uh, actually Jeff Hoffman was kind enough to attend along with Chuck Lloyd, I think, uh, uh, and Larry came too. And, and back then the policy was we will never engage. We've been taken out of human spaceflight and we will never engage because we all know it's a waste of time. Uh, that was Margaret Thatcher's government. We have moved, although it's not obvious to outsiders, we have moved to a position now where my government is saying we understand that there are arguments that support this and it's not a question of if but when and how. And, and that's, that's genuinely true, um, but it just needs a bit of effort to push it over the top. Uh, for my part, I am a specialist in anesthesiology and critical care medicine. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in physiology. I run the currently the only course in the UK in space medicine and extreme environment physiology. Um, as I say, I've been coming back and forth here for 10 years, haranguing people for support. Um, uh, and, you know, that's of relevance to this panel because the two messages that I have continued to be able to sell have been those of education and terrestrial benefits through knowledge transfer. Uh, and, and everything else is very difficult to sell to my government, but those seem to be recurring useful themes. Um, I think part of the question that we've been asked to answer today here is whether or not the space sector does enough to sell itself to prospective future space life scientists, space physicians. Uh, and I think the answer to that question is that, look, this stuff does sell itself, you know. I, I, I've done a lot of talking to people who are educators who are involved in outreach, and they basically say the bottom line is that there are two things that sell to kids. There is dinosaurs and there is space flight. Uh, and, and, and Jurassic Park isn't a documentary, apparently. So, 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 so we have space flight. Um, that said, I don't think that one should be complacent about that. It needs help to sell itself, and there need to be coordinated, properly resourced, comprehensive programs of outreach. Uh, uh, you know, and they need to reach out to kids from age four to 94, um, because if you don't imprint upon not just your school children, not just your college kids, but society in general, the value of science and what it can do at its best at the edge of the knife, that then you don't have that public support that turns into federal funds. Uh, that, I think, at least is true in my country. I think the challenge for the future is, is to attract the brightest and the best, to continue to attract the brightest and the best uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, and, and I think that for space life and medical sciences, we need to recognise, at least when we're training people up and encouraging this in this vein, that the number of operational opportunities is very small. The number of uh, flight surgeons and biomedical engineers worldwide probably num numbers in the few dozen tops. Um, but there are, I think the bulk of opportunities exist in science, uh, and so excellent programs of science are really where I try and draw my students to, because it's probably the best way for them to engage, at least from the UK. Uh, I'll finish by saying a, a, a lot of what we come across in the UK is people saying, well, why should we support human spaceflight? Because it only creates opportunities for a very narrow spectrum of people, for a very few people. And I think my answer to that is that it certainly does have the opportunity to inspire. That I think is a little bit like the Olympics. You know, a lot of people watch the Olympics, and yet of the many tens of thousands of people who watch it, hundreds of thousands of people who watch it, very few people are going to carry themselves down a 100-metre track in less than 10 seconds, but quite a lot of people are going to want to try and get fitter at the end of it. Uh, I think the same is true of, of, of human space exploration's role in education. <coughs> and, and, and like Dr Dunbar, you know, uh, in no other universe could an idiot like me have been so propelled from his earliest memory of the Apollo-Soyuz test project um, to this point of, you know, first-generation immigrant in a country with parents who basically didn't speak English particularly well, for whom nobody in his family had ever been to university, to be sitting here talking to you today. So I am very grateful for that. Uh, and on that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin, for um, those words. Jeff, um, astronaut, professor at uh, one of the famous uh, universities that produces uh, probably more space um, graduates than um, any other place here. Yeah? MIT, Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I, I will say as a follow-on from Kevin's talk that I've, I've also um, been invited 
uh, to be a visiting professor at the University of Leicester in the UK to teach a two-week short course on human spaceflight, which I did for the first time last year. And the response was tremendous. Um, you know, despite the country's unwillingness to participate in human space flight, the interest of the students was clearly there. And, uh, you know, we see this at, at MIT all the time. Now, obviously, our, our students at uh, MIT in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics are, are not the typical run-of-the-mill students. It's, we, we're fortunate to get the best and the brightest. But they, as well as, I think, students all over, are fascinated by space. And, and if I could put it in a word, the, the best motivation that, that we could give them is the ability to reach out and touch space through actually getting involved in projects that they can see are happening in space. Uh, I'll share with you an experience that we had in the uh, fall of 2003, a colleague and I were deciding what we should choose as a subject for the graduate student design uh, class, which we were going to lead in, in the spring. And we thought, you know, it's been a long time since we had a look at what it would take to go back to the moon and, and Mars, and why don't, why don't we dedicate the design class to a look at lunar and Mars exploration. And so we put out, uh, you know, an announcement that that's what the subject would be. And then, of course, in, in January, a couple of weeks before class started, President Bush made the announcement about the new vision for space exploration. And when we came in on the first day of classes, I mean, the excitement was, it was electric. You could have cut it with a knife. The, the idea that you know, this was not just a paper study, that th these students, for whom I think it's hard for, for a lot of the older people in the audience to realize how for the current generation of students, Apollo, as fascinating and as exciting as it was, it's ancient history. I mean, really, ancient history. It's like when I was a student looking back at the First World War. I mean, it's a lot of interesting history, but it was a long time ago. And, you know, they had sort of given up hope that they could actually participate in something like this. And so the, the idea for today's students that they actually could make something like this happen and to be a part of it is unbelievably motivating. And, and I think the best thing that any of us can do to ensure the, the supply of uh, another generation of scientists and engineers who will make this happen is, in fact, to do everything we can in the political and economic sphere to make sure that, that this program actually goes forward. Because, you know, we can talk about all sorts of special programs and the like, but um, the excitement of actually being to, able to take part in a new generation of space exploration, you can't get better motivation than that. Now, what are some of the things that the students have difficulty with? Well, first of all, um, there's a lot of um, uncertainty about uh, the whole employment situation. I mean, on the one hand, we hear about the fact that NASA doesn't have enough young people and that the average age is increasing one year per year. But then every, every year my students come to me and they say, well, if that's true, then why isn't NASA hiring more people? I mean, we have people who'd love to go to work for NASA. And in fact, I just got an email recently <coughs> saying that, that in fact, uh, this email came from a friend at Glenn who said, Glenn is gonna hire 30 people this year, which is great, um, and that maybe other centers will be doing the same thing. I mean, those positions are going to get snapped up because we, we do have a lot of people who really want to work for NASA and for the aerospace industry. Um, the same question about the uncertainty in the employment in the aerospace industry. Um, you know, if, if there's such a concern about the lack of qualified engineers, then uh, Clearly, everybody should, every qualified engineer should be able to get a job, and, and yet, you know, we have cyclical times when some people have difficulty. You know, granted, our 
that it's not such a difficulty for our MIT students, but you know, when you read the, the pages of Aviation Week, uh, you'll, you'll know what I'm referring to. Uh, the irregularity of funding for research projects, uh, and this has been particularly painful in the life sciences, that everybody appreciates what happened a few years ago when so many existing projects were just sliced off and, and a generation uh, of students who were going to be getting PhDs with these experiments were kind of left high and dry. That is very, very demoralizing. And, um, you know, you know the maintaining a continuity of opportunities for students is critical to the pipeline. Uh, I'll mention one other thing that, that I see every day at, at MIT where our graduate student population is between a third and a half non-U.S. citizens, many of which, uh, many of whom uh, really would like to stay in the country. And quite a few of them have come up to me and told me that, you know, gee, I'd, I'd really like to do aeronautics and astronautics, but as a non-U.S. citizen, I know I'm probably not going to be able to get a job in the industry, and therefore I'm going to do MECI or EE or, or the like because the employment possibilities are that much better. So as a nation, we are losing a potential uh, large resource of, of excellent trained engineers because of this. Uh, I'm going to be out at Ames this summer with the International Space University, and uh, when I was out there last fall um, talking to some of the, the NASA employees, they were commenting that, you know, they've got a lot of competition out there that, uh, you know, when a, a young engineer is going, uh, if, if it's a guy, for instance, and he's taking, taking a woman out on a date, and he says, uh, I'm, I'm working for NASA, it's not nearly as sexy, apparently, as to say I'm working for Google. And uh, now that may be because the Google engineer is probably earning five times as much as the NASA engineers, which, which, which helps. Um, but I, again, I, I think that um, the, the problem is that, that right now the public perception doesn't see the excitement in the space station. This is a little bit painful for for us in, in the conversations over the, the last day and a half about all the interesting research that can be carried out on the International Space Station and life sciences, and I'm enthusiastic about all, and life sciences and a lot of other things as well. Um, but I think we need to be honest with ourselves that the ISS is a laboratory, and people generally don't get excited about what goes on in laboratories. I mean, it doesn't get on the front page of the news, whether it's CERN or the NIH. Every once in a while, a great discovery gets made, and, and then people get excited about it, but we can't expect people you know, to have the same level of excitement as you know, going beyond the Earth and, and seeing people driving around ex exploring the moon. So. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, that the, the best thing that we can do for the future of NASA is to make sure that the uh, exploration program uh, goes ahead. And the one other thing that I'd, I'd like to mention is that um, another thing that happened over the last few years, which I think has been very detrimental, not just to um, the development of, of new engineers, but to NASA itself, is that NASA made a decision actually at, at the very top uh, to stop supporting a lot of TRL-2 and 3 type engineering research. And um, so again, this has had a huge impact on the research funding coming into universities and the ability to support graduate students. I'd like to see NASA as a technological innovator, and that means putting a certain amount of money into uh, low technological readiness engineering research so that we are developing the engineering uh, and scientific capabilities and uh, hardware that we will need in the future rather than living off the land. And I, I think that's absolutely critical. So I, I hope that NASA's policy with respect to that will change, and, and that also will do a 
tremendous service to being able to uh, feed the excitement of engineering students in being able to develop the new technologies that NASA really will need a generation from now if we're going to continue space exploration. Thank you, Jeff, for leading us through uh, this whole question of inspiration and opportunities. Um, Barbara, you, you've actually were a teacher before you went into space, uh, which is pretty unusual. Uh, and uh, you're now with the Boys State University. Uh, please, um, your comments. Well, thank you. And actually, my first comment is a, a reaction that it shouldn't be. And I'm uh, delighted that we have more teachers in the program now. We had two that, uh, that uh, attached the uh, last set of solar arrays onto the International Space Station, and the next one who will be flying in about nine months from now. And, um, helping to complete its construction. So thank you all, and I particularly wanted to thank Dr. Alford and Mr. Abbey and, and Kent for letting me participate in this uh, institute. I've learned a lot in the last uh, day and a half. Um, I totally agree with what Jeff says. Um, we definitely need to have space exploration out there. It's a great driver for great education. And what I wanted, I wanted to bring up three points. One is about students, one is about teachers, and one is about excuse me, international cooperation. So about students, we've heard a lot today about motivation, and motivation is everything. And I will always remember my first commander, Dick Scobie, talking about how if we can motivate our children, everything is possible. And I truly believe that. And I think that what students need is uh, to get that motivation is opportunities to actually do real stuff that give them the... Um, the picture that these are things that they can do, much like Ludmilla, what you talked about at the university level. And um, I think that's important at all grade levels from pre-kindergarten all the way up through through university and beyond. And uh, one of the examples I can give you, one of the most recent ones, we just took a, uh, had a group of students from Boise State University. These were sophomores through graduate students who flew on in NASA's microgravity university um, opportunity. And they did a tremendous job. It opened up a whole new life for them, a whole new set of opportunities. They all know where they want to go and what they want to do, and they will be very successful at it. And what I am most proud of is that many of these students are first in family to go to college. And I found out from them later that this was something that they've always wanted to do, but they just never thought that it was anything that they could do. It was beyond their reach. And so to be able to have those opportunities really made the difference for them. Second point is about teachers, and we do teach our students best, our children best, through their teachers. <coughs> and teachers need to have those same real hands-on, real opportunities that we want to give our students. And those teachers will go back to their own classrooms and to their communities where they know how their students learn best, and they will translate the, the experiences that they had into real experiences for their students to do in their classrooms, and that makes all the difference in the world as well. And third, and this really comes a lot from what I've learned um, today, and also from my experiences in uh, b being very fortunate to get to help construct the International Space Station. It is a marvelous laboratory, but beyond that, it is also a marvelous piece of engineering. And beyond that, it is a wonderful home, and it is an international home. And um, I was thinking that um, if we could have an opportunity and many opportunities for all the spacefaring nations to work together to bring teachers together and experience real, real um, work in the different um, spacefaring nations and what's going on and be able to collaborate with each other, I think that would do amazing things for our, all of our education programs. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective on the um, pre-university level aspects. Very interesting. Michael Simpson is the president of a university set up just to um, graduate space um, uh, practitioners. Michael, International Space University president. Well, thank you. It's, um, it's interesting, as we've heard uh, at this panel and I think from some of the other presentations, that we're at this strange moment where we... Um, where we know that uh, dinosaurs and space flight do inspire the current generation, and we just can't seem to understand that if we've all gotten so old, uh, you know, we seem like we offer both dinosaurs and space flight. So uh, it, the reality is the generation that I'm working with doesn't really see it that way. They, they, they see a generation they are inspired by. 
Uh, I, you know, I think we need to control our own rhetoric every once in a while. We need to understand that I'm seeing record applications from around the world from people who want to participate in the space sector. Now, they all define that differently. They're not all in the launch and fly business. A lot of them are in the download data, communicate better, find a way to reduce uh, the problems of remote populations. But they're all tied to this sense uh, that space is uh, a, both an inspiration and a set of solutions and that you can do exciting things in a lot of different places. And I, I think we, we, we need to keep in mind that one of the things we're doing and one of the things we try very hard to do at the International Space University is to uh, teach people that not only do they have a responsibility to learn their field very well, to apply, to make good things happen, they have a responsibility to reach out. They have a responsibility to um, be volunteers in museums. They have the responsibility to get into classrooms. They have the responsibility to spend those squirming minutes dealing with some maybe half-informed interviewer on a radio or television story uh, just to get the message out, to be able to communicate. And uh, as I've thought about this, and I, and I felt passionately about this, um, I have a sense that Something that sums up for me why you need to invest in education, not just money, but time and enthusiasm, is this sense that um, leadership and vision, no matter how great they are, have generational limits. A at the far horizon where, where the people's, where people's most um, uh, acute vision becomes blurred. What matters most is whether we have taught the next generation to see. We've got to recognize that we can only see so far and that we need to get the next generation ready to go. And so one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that in addition to all the rigorous knowledge, all the solid academic work that we put into our curricula, we need to inspire. We need to inspire the brilliant and the people who aren't so brilliant. We need to be able to get people to the point where, uh, when we're not around to provide the momentum from whatever source it is that's driven us, uh, we can count on their being able to see the opportunities that we helped uh, make possible. Uh, most of us have grown up in an environment where we er learned early this remarkable quotation from um, uh, from Sir Isaac Newton that said that if I have seen farther than other, let's say, people, uh, it is uh, because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Uh, we need to understand there is a corollary to that. And that is if we believe the current generation isn't seeing very well, maybe it's because giants are standing on their shoulders. And, and that we, 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 we need to recognize that we have an intergenerational partnership opportunity of extraordinary proportions uh, at this moment in history. So uh, how are we reacting to that at the International Space University? For one thing, we have noticed a, a, a dramatic, uh, until this year, a 10% year-over-year increase in applications over the last um, uh, about six years of the of the history of the university. Um, I say until this year because this year it's popped up to about a 35 to 40 percent increase and and uh, even when we correct for the possibility there are a few people thinking better graduate school than the unemployment line, um, we're recognizing a lot of these people are coming out of secure jobs to which they will go back and so uh, there's, there's, there's a sense that uh, there is an opportunity to be seized. One of the areas of opportunity that is coming up regularly in applicant essays and in applicant interest statements is space life science and space medicine. I, you know, space flight, that motivates dinosaurs, that motivates something about our being biological organisms get us, gets us sort of interested in learning about how this very different environment of space impacts biological organisms. There's a kind of natural intellectual empathy uh, there. 
Uh, as a result, uh, a number now about four years ago in partnership with JAXA, uh, we were able to bring uh, Chiaki Mukai to the International Space University for a three-year uh, period of duty to help us sort of create a much more permanent, deep, more deeply rooted uh, space life science program. Uh, out of that has now emerged a, an arrangement with the uh, French space agency, CANES, uh, that is sponsoring a, a chair that will be a life science uh, based uh, chair at ISU. Uh, keep in mind that we're not a life science school. We're an interdisciplinary school of space studies, but we really believe that one of the growth areas for the future is going to be space uh, life science. Well, why that? Uh, we do think that public uh, exploration is going to take a lot of professional astronauts into situations uh, very different uh, from those that we have uh, confronted in the past and much longer duration than we have yet uh, had great depth of experience with. But we also really see that the personal spaceflight business, uh, as speculative as it still seems until the first flights have really taken place, although they're scheduled for uh, less than a, um, a year and a half uh, from now, is going to create a whole new array of opportunities in space life science. For one thing, you're going to have a lot more subjects. There's going to be a lot more data. Um, we're beginning to get inquiries from general practitioners who want to take at least short courses in space studies because they have a patient who has just come to them saying, I've just signed up to go fly with Sir Richard Branson, or uh, I'm going up with XCOR, or I understand there's a company out there that wants to uh, uh, take people to orbit within the next three or four years, and I want to fly. And uh, they want to have some idea of what the information base is so that as a GP, they can at least uh, provide some of the early uh, information that's needed. Uh, one of the insights to us in that is that there is need for non-specialist education as well as for specialist education. And the non-specialist education will not only be useful to building the base that we're trying to build, it's also going to be useful as outreach and is building the constituency that we need to have more voices out there saying, this is a good thing. Uh, yeah, uh, taking a few risks under the right circumstances is a good thing. Uh, we are a species that has uh, evolved that way, and we seem to do uh, very well that way. Uh, okay, that interest Ma Ma Michael, could I um, ask you to wrap up here and pick it up in questions? That interest <laughs> is particularly broad worldwide. Um, we find very high peaks and val valleys with interest in, in launch technology or satellite technology, but worldwide the interest in space life science is broadly felt. And as we look out at the opportunities that are presented over the next uh, uh, several years, uh, we think we are at a point uh, where the amount of uh, investment of people's educational time and personal intellectual interest in this field uh, is going to get uh, very much bigger and the opportunities are in fact going to get uh, very much greater and more broadly spread. Thank you for that perspective. <coughs> we move now to uh, William Thompson, Baylor College of Medicine, the NSBRI leader. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a, uh, great comments from the other members of the panel. It's a, uh, for the last 30 years, we've recognized that there's waning interest in science and mathematics, uh, STEM careers uh, nationally and inter internationally. That's obvious. There's been multiple reports issued on, uh, on these issues. Uh, we're concerned about the quality of our teachers in K through 16 and at the universities. We're concerned about the public's lack of interest in science at all not just the space program. So these are real concerns that we've been addressing as educators and as scientists. We all want to replace ourselves with young people such as those sitting here in the front row and you have a responsibility to challenge us, make us better, irritate the hell out of us, make us do our jobs to make you better than what we are and what we do. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a challenging problem and, they, and the metaphor that we've used is, is, is interesting. It's always the metaphor of the pipeline. The pipeline's leaking, the pipeline this, but the pipeline gives a connotation that it's a well understood pathway and it's not it's complex we're dealing with different generations of students uh, right now the the children of generation xers our children are now entering the universities and our children 
want things now. They don't want to be scientists. They don't want to be educators. They want things now. So we've lost the, uh, this entire 20-year population of students, by and large, who don't want to do the types of work that we do and work as hard as we do, and, and God knows what their children will want. So it's a, uh, it, it's a difficult challenge, but it's not well understood. The, uh, the metaphor that Derek Bach and uh, William Bowden used, the presidents of Harvard and Princeton, respectively, talked about a river. And the met I think that river metaphor is easier to under help us understand understand the issues that we're facing versus a linear model where the river is wide at some times, it's clear, it runs fast, and where it's wide you can actually get big, big footprints of activities. At NSBRI we do things, we partner with media activities, we write curriculum materials, we, we, do, we build websites that reach millions of people with our content. And those are important type things that we've been able to do where it narrows, and, with, and, it's, and it's understood, we've established graduate programs and it helps to establish the bioastronautics program at MIT and the space life sciences programs at Texas A&M University. So these are uh, systemic changes where there have been deliberate investments of our d dollars that, we, that we're stewards of the dollars that are provided to us by NASA and by the federal government. And we do have data and we know what's working and what doesn't work, and that's really important as we move forward. Now, if I had an opportunity, and I wrote this before this morning's Houston Chronicle, if I ever had an opportunity to talk to NASA leadership, which I never have, and I've been doing this now for 12 years, and I've, ne I've never had an opportunity of ever talking to anybody in NASA leadership, and, I, uh, uh, and thank goodness somebody else just walked into the room, I'd suggest that, as was suggested by Secretary Baker last night, this is awe-inspiring up right up here. Nobody has one of these. It's been, it, it represents a political and a scientific achievement. This is Secretary Baker's words, but it also represents an extraordinary, Barbara, educational opportunity for that we can come together and develop activities. Now, I might not have said this a few, few weeks ago, but one of my faculty members with NSBRI funding flew a bunch of spiders and butterflies in space, and one of the spiders got lost and every news media in the country picked up on the fact that they couldn't find that spider. The mission commander, uh, 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 Michael Fink, Funk, Fink, I think his name, Fink, he, he couldn't find it, and he was not particularly happy when they asked him to look for the second orb spider. And then, they, of course, the media picked up, the spider's loose, the spider's going to become radiated, you know, it's going to eat all the astronauts. And, and, and more inquiries came into us about the lost spider and more interest was generated in doing this pilot project to determine that could we actually do real-time experiences and experiments with elementary school children and their teachers than we've ever had before. So there's an opportunity, I think well-designed activities could be done. So use the space station. Use this as an international opportunity for co collaboration in partnership, not only for science and political considerations, but also for education. The second point I'd recommend to NASA and anyone else is you guys are experts in technology and experts in communications. If you haven't noticed that everyone in the country is Twittering, Facebooking, and webbing, and we don't have not used that. We've not exploited that media. More people Twitter than watch television. Every, uh, more students, you go to your students, your medical students and your graduate students and ask how many people have a Facebook account. And I would suggest that just about everybody in the audience is going to raise their hand. So let's exploit the, the social media and the web-based media, but with well-designed studies of what works and what doesn't. We do not know if web-based education is equivalent to didactic education. That has not been proven yet. And we, if we had good investments and goods well studied, probably comparison groups, we can't do randomly controlled studies, this might move us forward a little bit farther down the way. And my third point I would make is that there are excellent pathway programs that have been documented for years on how to increase access of underrepresented citizens in science and medicine. At Baylor College of Medicine, through the leadership of Dr. Alford and others, we established BSMD programs with uh, minority-serving institutions where students from, who are Hispanic and black who never would have had an opportunity to access a medical education now do so. 
So if it's a program where you identify them in high school, you protect them, you provide economic support, social support for them, academic support for them, put them in your laboratories during the summer, keep them away from other people who are looking for the same quality students, but you're growing your own scientists and doctors for the future, and that can be done, and it doesn't cost that much money to do so. So, uh, if, yeah, yeah now this is just the wishful thinking, but if I had an opportunity of saying something to somebody who may make a difference, is use the space station, develop pathway programs that actually work with minority serving institutions and the best colleges and universities in the country. A pathway program with MIT or Texas A&M University would come to mind first. And then if, uh, and, the sec and the last thing I'd say is that let's exploit your skills and technology and our skills in education, and let's demonstrate to the nation that the stuff like this could work. Thank you. Thank you. That was very um, insightful. Uh, finally, um, in terms of the prepared presentations, I'm pleased to invite Alexandra Sasha Titova to make some comments to us. Уважаемые друзья, dear friends. Most um, of the panelists have been talking about students. I understand that that's very important uh, to talk about students at an institute. I work with um, school children and I represent uh, the Cosmonaut Training Center in the Star City and we started out our outreach program about 10 years ago and we are the program that uh, gets the children ready to select their careers. So the primary objective of the group that deals with children at GCTC is uh, early um, career selection or career familiarization. The idea uh, for this program at GCTC uh, occurred to me because I, uh, of the things I saw in Houston, and I must uh, say uh, thank you very much, George Abbey, for allowing me to touch this uh, wonderful project uh, of um, school children outreach. And this gave me an opportunity to do something which I could not have even dreamed about uh, before age 40. And you know probably that Star City does not have too many employees at the Gagarin Training Center. And we have, however, we have found people uh, that work with children uh, in their spare time, and they are very open about it. And this idea that I brought in, and uh, the fact that I followed in the footsteps of uh, uh, Mr. Abbey uh, and continued to, doing, to do this was supported uh, and gave people an opportunity to believe in me and in this program. If we talk about uh, this year, we have had 600 children from all over Russia participating in our project, and they were all very interested in what was going on at GCTC. They were invited to the Gagarin Training Center, and that's very important for the children to be able to touch the actual activities, to the uh, to be able to talk to the people that uh, do the work and to um, partake of the uh, influence and the authority of these mentors uh, in selecting the correct uh, path through life. I could go on uh, for very long. Everyone knows uh, what it is to be able to deal with uh, teenagers. This is a special age where people are looking for something interesting and for something um, exciting, and if they can find something interesting and exciting, they will follow it. And I have children already that have selected their careers, uh, that have gone to the Bauman Technical University and have come back to GCTC uh, to work as instructors, which is an indication of how important uh, getting to the children while they're still in school is, and while there is a, there are 
are changes in the um, Russian government. Uh, government uh, public servants may not find the time to uh, do this uh, outreach and work with children and think about their future. So the fact that people have taken on some of the responsibility that normally rests with a government official is wonderful. And if this continues, uh, we will get to a proper uh, level. Uh, what we are lacking right now is we are lacking uh, community communication, interaction, uh, the children are lacking interaction with children from other nations, and what we would like very much to do uh, uh, to, uh, is to establish a children's intercosmos program. Uh, this is an idea that, that we came up with um, this year uh, for children to meet, to exchange science projects, uh, art, uh, models, and what we had when we were training in Houston and made friends with U.S. astronauts and uh, made friends with uh, neighbors that helped us out, uh, opened uh, some horizons for us, and we would like uh, to give the same opportunity to our children as well. And I should say that our competition is uh, called the Star Relay Race, and it has very many interesting things for the children. We also have another project, uh, which we call United Cosmos, United Space, which uh, is a name that Yuri Glaskov came up with uh, as a name for our project. He was a wonderful uh, book writer, and I wanted to use the words of some of the protagonists of his book. Uh, this name of United Cosmos gives um, um, uh, focus to what we're doing and we'll be very happy if your children come and visit us and we'll be very happy to visit you to see uh, what you're doing with your uh, school children. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you very much uh, for that uh, perspective. Well, we're now at the point where we um, can really interact and um, use the expertise of the panelists, which um, have displayed so many different facets of the education field. And I'm going to offer the floor first to our three uh, young people here, if they have some questions of this um, group. Um, I took a couple of notes here, based on the, the comments and, and uh, feedback from the panel. Uh, like Dr. Uh, Dunbar and Dr. Fong, I have the privilege of being the first generation of my family to go to college and even to graduate high school. Um, and I also had an even bigger privilege of being the sole uh, foreign uh, NASA civil servant for the past decade at uh, Johnson Space Center. Um, some observations are made over the years and, and I'm back now as a student. Um, being an MIT graduate in, in undergrad in class of 2000, I was the only person in my class to go to NASA, um, even even now, eventually, um, and that was kind of you know, I think that's a that's a disappointment. So uh, you know, having seen presentations by folks like Neil Lane and also the former CTO of Lockheed Martin, Mal O'Neill, where they talk about the supply problem of engineers, there's definitely an issue of uh, an interest problem of the ones that are produced now. Um, most uh, the majority of my class ended up going into finance and um, Wall Street and uh, information technology. Maybe with the recession, uh, there'll be much more supply of engineers now. Um, the overall, the NASA experience from an educational point of view has been fa fantastic for me. And one of the highlights of my career was mentoring young students, including the Texas Aerospace Scholars. Um, over the years, I've worked with about 20 of them. And then also working with Houston area high schools to teach them about nanotechnology and advanced materials. Um, the NASA experience also brought out ideas of you know, what are my strengths and weaknesses, and one of my weaknesses is how bored and unproductive I can become when there is basically no demand, funding, 
uh, time or willingness uh, for the consideration of, of, of what Dr. Hoffman was talking about, the low TRL advanced technologies. Um, and that's not just at an operational space, uh, space flight center like uh, Johnson Space Flight Center, but that's also at um, research centers such as Ames. Um, there's a big disconnect there. Um, but that's, that's all my contacts or all my uh, comments for the moment. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a graduate student here at Rice. I'm actually in my last few months here, so I wish I could have been at this meeting earlier because it's very interesting. But it seems like most of the focus is for young kids, um, K through 12. What about, at that point, lots of kids want to be astronauts, want to go to space. What about after that, like the college years? You know, what could be done to motivate older kids to actually go? Yeah, well, um, when I talked about having the opportunity to touch space, I think, um, you know, despite my comments that, that the, um, you know, exploration program will uh, be capable of generating more excitement than the International Space Station, I think that that's not true in terms of opportunities for students because if we properly utilize the space station uh, to give students a chance to participate in things that are actually going on with experiments, and college students are capable of, of doing that, as you know, um, the excitement that it generates is, is tremendous. I mean, we, we've had some discussions with Bill Gerstenmeier, and he's very supportive uh, of that and, and has said he'll do anything in his capability other than the fact that he has no money to support a program like that, but he'd, he'd, he'd do anything he can to make it happen. So the, the ability to, uh, to get student, uh, real legitimate student science done on the space station as well as professional science, I think could do, go a great way to uh, exciting college students to carry on in, in these fields. Je Jeff, are you aware of any programs that uh, enable that at the moment? Um, not yet. Uh, you know, we're still building the station. And uh, as I said, um, Bill Gerstenmeier would, would love to see something like that. I, there may be things going on that I'm not aware of. You know, certainly NASA has been supporting things like CubeSats, and, and there have been uh, innovative programs allowing students to get access to space and and I'd like to see that expanded and and the space station is is clearly a, a good place to do it something all the partners can perhaps address uh, Bonnie you want some as a you know we had similar pro uh, programs going all the way back I think to Skylab and shuttle oh, you can the go shuttle back. we did yes. yes and so what we need to do is uh, I think revisit those that work very well uh, the reason that they were eliminated had nothing to do with their productivity. It had everything to do with budget <laughs> and funding. So uh, it's, you know, look at what worked. And that's what we're doing right back down in K through 12 right now. I'm not reinventing the wheel. You find that hands-on experiences with the which the schools can no longer afford to give their students because their budgets are being cut are what help bring students into those fields. And if I could comment one more thing on, on Jeff, one of the, I also am working with the University of Washington and sit on a couple of visiting committees. When we finally have students come to, them, to us at the end of their sophomore year and they've been majoring in business or they've been majoring, thinking they're going to pre-law and suddenly the light comes on and they say, I want to be a scientist and an engineer, we find out that they weren't advised in high school to take enough math physics, chemistry, or science, and there's so much peer pressure not to fall behind your friends that they give it a few, little bit of thought and they say, well, gee, I don't want to go to school in the summer, I don't want to do a fifth year. They'll come to regret that eventually if they give up that dream, but it goes back down into advising uh, by the time you're in the eighth grade as to what you ought to be taking as well. It's my understanding that the, uh, that the focus for the future with the ISS becoming a national lab, at least for the U.S. segment, I hope it is international, but that there are some projects right now that are being looked at as um, uh, test beds for how we can really open it up and, and make it work for everybody. And some of okay. those are university <coughs> level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jacob, and then uh, we've got a question there. 
Hi, uh, Jacob Berlin from Rice University here. I'm a postdoc. And first of all, I want to thank you all for uh, the opportunity here. This really, this is one of these things that inspires. The meeting's been very open and welcoming. And I think in general, having more student participation in things like this, maybe not such a small elite event, but more events like this is truly inspiring. I mean, seeing the presentation from Antarctica and the video, I mean, I want to go to space now too, but uh, I, I guess uh, one thing I would touch on, and maybe I'm cheating because I'm stealing this from the graduation speech from uh, my PhD, but I think one of the key problems in all science education and space in particular is this communication of exciting problems to the the lay student or the lay person. Um, you touched on it with the idea of exploration. You touched on it with the idea of talking to interviewers. And I, I think it's something that we can all do do more of. And I think it's daunting in the age of Facebook and Twitter when you consider, like, what is the grand challenge of space now when you're in college? And you're not sure. It sounds pretty intricate. It sounds very specialized. You're not sure exactly how to get there. And then, I don't know, little things uh, sort of light up my eyes. Like this morning, Dr. Vector mentioned... You know, bacteria sense gravity somehow. Nobody knows. That seems pretty amazing. So I wonder how you guys talk about sort of encouraging message distribution and simplification for for those sorts of audiences, for, for all of us. I know we all struggle with it. Well, I, you know, one reaction I have to your comment, and it really follows with your statement about how do you uh, motivate people who've moved beyond high school, and maybe they are a little bit in a trap that they haven't taken as much as they need to take to easily go into another field. Um, I, I, I think part of the answer to that is uh, the most motivating thing in my intellectual career and in that of many of the people I know who've selected similar careers uh, have been the questions. And, and, and too often when we're dealing with undergraduates in particular, uh, we're, we're eager to give them answers. We're eager for, and we evaluate them on whether they know answers. Um, uh, sharing the questions can be wonderful. I'd, quite by accident, early in my teaching career, I uh, probably at that point too dumb to know that this was pretty darn risky. Somebody posed a question. Uh, it was actually an economics class, and it was an intriguing question, and I didn't really have the answer, and so we broke away from the notes and started doing the analysis on, yes, frankly, the chalkboard, as it was at the time, uh, and that that so engaged the class that I realized that the way I'd started off teaching was the wrong way, that we really needed to get people involved in that. And so I think part of the response is um, that we need to be willing to share questions. The things that we don't know are really motivating. Uh, and, and I think that that is especially true at the undergraduate level where often we don't share that kind of thing with undergraduates. Kevin, you had a comment. Uh, just briefly in, re in reply to what the grand challenges are, I mean, I think everyone has their different ideas about what that is currently. I can only speak for the way my government perceives this. Uh, and they look at the science and the excellence of science, and the theme that's emerged for them is the astro astrobiological context. They feel, and, uh, and, and we've discussed this quite a lot, that, um, uh, that understanding the nature and origin of life in the universe and its likely ubiquity is probably one of the greatest challenges that science and technology faces in this new century. I, I think I do agree with that. I think that half of that, maybe more than half that, can be addressed by robotic and automated platforms. I think that actually the, the detailed prospecting of uh, the inner solar system, particularly the surfaces of the Moon and Mars, probably can only be done in the foreseeable future by human-tended uh, outposts, I think. And so I think if you asked me to say what the grand challenge was, I would say that it was the, the partnership between humans and robots and narrowing down that astrobiological question. Okay. Yeah, uh, just a, 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 about two points here that have been discussed already. The first thing is is that getting uh, the younger students engaged, whether they're uh, middle school, high school, or even uh, undergraduates, um, one of the ways that this could be approached is, and I think this has been done before in other venues, but I don't know if NASA's done it, but as a requirement, we, we issue grants still. We're not doing the same kind of levels of fundamental research that we were before, but we're still doing it and issuing grants. Make a condition on those grants that they have to have a partner school, okay, that's addressing an education theme in reference to their experiment, their flight experiment. And that way, even without asking for more money right now, you can already get it engaged. And I think that 
it's a useful way to do things because it forces I, I was a PI outside before I came inside NASA so but it actually forces you to uh, you know to make those kinds of considerations and what you want to include to make your program more robust that was the first thing the second thing had to do with the mention of the National Laboratory uh, the National Laboratory exists because of a congressional directive to bring research on an ISS to a level that's equivalent, and a level, and I'll give you an explanation of what I mean by level, that's equivalent to the other national laboratories that we have, like Argonne and Oak Ridge, uh, <coughs> Loma Linda, and, and uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Brookhaven. And, and so, so that was the idea behind that. The national lab has the same availability uh, that all the other national labs do. Now the question is, what will we, you know will the federal government do to actually bring the support of that concept up? But we have actually stepped up as NASA and created that situation and started the partnerships to to work with other agencies in that regard. We have agreements with the NIH and with the Department of Agriculture. All of these folks interested in actually participating in a national lab segment of ISS. So uh, uh, it's not intended to be strictly U.S., but it's whatever we can do under agreements with any other countries. For us to try to do that right from the onset to include the entire international community in the national lab concept was something that was not under the umbrella of that directive. Okay, but that was a directive. We were actually told to do that. Okay, thank you. On. Charlie Bolden with the NSBRI board. Um, a question, I guess, to, to the panel, sort of in response to the question from the young lady about opportunities for college students. Um, what do you think about consideration of collaboration between the Department of Education, NASA, other federal agencies, and uh, commercial uh, startup space companies? You know, we, uh, a sounding rocket is a sounding rocket is a sounding rocket. Spaceship One is a big sounding rocket. Um, as we, it, 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 does it make any sense to try to involve them as a part of this this uh, family of, of organizations that we use to try to promote educational opportunities for not just for kids in, in secondary and elementary schools, but for students in colleges. And I'll give you one example. The University of Southern California had a group of kids who started a rocket club. It has grown immensely, and they now have contact with Scale Composites because Scale is right up the, you know, right up the road from them at Mojave and uh, some of them serve as interns at Scale Composite. So what I fear is that we always, we get insular when we think about NASA as the only opportunity for uh, inspiration when, in terms of space exploration. I think we've got we to open up the mold a little bit and uh, do some collaboration, if you will. I could take a shot at that, if I might. Just, just a, it's a, uh, your, your memorandum of, of agreement with NIH has uh, been discussed at NIH at the study panels uh, it, with, uh, with NASA and the U.S. Department of Education. It's, uh, I think that for years we were in silos, and now it recognizes that it's, we're all one, one system, it's all one problem. Education belongs to all of us. You know, the, the more people who are informed about, who are scientifically literate, who can make quite uh, uh, informed decisions about us, uh, our social contract is what they will be talking about at the agencies. It's a, it just makes sense. It's in, it's a, in our own self-interest that we work together and on, on different problems. The uh, uh, U.S. Department of Education doesn't, can't do a whole lot with rockets. And they can't do a whole lot with, with in some of the other areas of NIH. But if we work together and we work together smartly, I think we can, uh, you know, get a little bit farther down the road than, than otherwise is the case. It's a good point. On on the the subject of the the commercial space industry, that is extremely attractive to our students. I mean, I've noticed over the past few years when when I sit down with students and ask, you know, what are your plans after graduation, the proportion of people who say, I'd, I'd like to get a job in the commercial industry has been going up and up and up. Uh, because again, it, it's something new, it's something excitement, and it, it's something exciting, and, and it does give them that sense of touching space, the idea that, you know, individual people, private citizens can go into space and they can be a part of it is 
very motivating and very exciting. And from an educational point of view, I think, you know, Elon Musk has said that, that he's willing to make space available on the Dragon for experiments. And, you know, if we can get money to, to build those experiments and, and he's willing to fly them, boy, that's great. Yeah, we actually have a couple of, of, of uh, written agreements now with startup companies or companies a little bit further along. Uh, um, the Excalibur company in, uh, in Europe, uh, certainly uh, we've, uh, we've been working with a, a tremendous amount of excitement on the part of students uh, involved in that. Uh, the, X Prize, the Google Lunar X Prize, uh, we, we hosted the summit in order to get students' experience with these new teams. But uh, I would caution you not to underestimate the value of the NASA brand in this. Uh, we get to work with NASA very, very well. We also get to work with ESA, which, unlike NASA, has a specific education mission. It's a, you know, just a different political decision. But those brands, when they're there, sort of add a real cachet of being at the frontier. And uh, it, the, the students are not just thinking about where they're going to go on graduation. They're thinking of how am I going to invest my life. And, and what you're doing has the excitement of being about where their life is going. And uh, so be a partner. I, you know, fight to not be the only player, but, but be a partner in NASA. I mean, we really need that brand. Yeah, well, this is obviously a popular question. You know, just <coughs> might make a <coughs> final last comment on it. Yeah. Com final comment is, is that it's a great brand, but there really aren't that many resources coming down from NASA. I co-chaired an academy uh, project a year ago, and what we were asked to look at, and it goes back to what Jeff was talking about, was the reduction of technology investment in the universities and across the board. And we, for the first time in probably several decades, actually terminated 700 graduate students. And that cascades down into undergraduates looking at NASA and as a faculty as well. As the president of a museum, I have no government funds. You know who is funding this K through 12 are individuals, uh, grant uh, givers, uh, and just you know going out to everyone else. But the federal government, the local government, the state government do not fund any of our programs. So there's a lot of leveraging out there because there's a lot of understanding of the critical nature of answering this question on our pipeline. But the leadership and the branding is NASA. I get no NASA funds for my aerospace aerospace scholars program, and neither did. JSC, they, they did in kind, but most of their funding came from the Texas legislature. So we need that kind of partnership, but it's out there. Yes. Uh, I would like mention and uh, uh, say about situation in uh, Russian in Russian space program. Uh, Institute of Biomedical Problem, for example, are responsible for uh, medical safety of cosmonaut and also of biomedical uh, scientific program. And uh, I couldn't say a lot of, but many our post postgraduate students deeply involved in space flight experiment. I uh, I, I mean, see Inessa, for example, Inessa, PhD student involved in space flight experiment and pre-flight and post-flight uh, investigation. My postgraduate student uh, carried out a flight experiment on Russian segment of ISS. And institute responsible for this work together with PhD student and space flight experiment is part of this PhD work. Okay. Let's move on to the next question, and then we go Walt there. Cunningham, uh, thank you. It's been the broadest discussion I've heard of the problems, the interaction of education today and space. And what I have to say probably doesn't apply so much to, like you, Jeff, you're always at MIT, you're always going to have people. It's more likely, like Sasha Titova or Bonnie Dunbar's problem, is how do we address the dearth of candidates in science and math and other, I would call them high achieving areas of education. Uh, we reap what we sow. I've been talking to high school and college students now for probably about 40 years, whenever I can't get out of it. And I always ask the question about people wanting to uh, either go to work for NASA. I used to always ask if they wanted to be astronauts, but sometimes I get no hands on that anymore. So I broadened it out for people to go to work in aerospace. Uh, and I can tell you, 
that in the 1960s and 70s, we get almost everybody would raise their hands, young kids even. Today, uh, I presented a $10,000 scholarship at the uh, University of Florida, Central Florida, and I had 50 people and I got like three hands. So there's a problem, and this is at the far end of the pipeline. You really need to have to address at the beginning of the pipeline. And I think that that's part of the reason why we're getting it. Uh, K through 12, for example, you know, you maybe can't address it, but I'd, I'd like to know what you think about the fact that most people will agree that we've been having, going through a dumbing down of education. Uh, you know, leave no one behind in the classes. Uh, don't fail anyone, it's bad on their self-esteem. I'll tell you another quick aside. I was at Huntsville about two years ago and on the spur of the moment, they asked me if I would go talk to about 60 teachers, K through 12 teachers, that they had there uh, going through the space camp kind of thing. And since I was on the spur of the moment, I thought, well, I'll, I'll get this off my chest. And I went in and I basically talked about all the phony efforts at building self-esteem instead of doing the right thing. And I thought, this is really going to kind of tick them off. When I finished, they all... They clapped. I mean, I, it was one of the best reactions I ever had because they too are fed up with this kind of thing. So we need to have more em emphasis on uh, uh, challenge and reward. Self-esteem comes from self-reliance and overcoming challenges and hardships. So we need to get more out of our students, demand more out of our students and our teachers, as a matter of fact. Uh, we need to encourage students to take risks and the corollary to risk is failure. So we've got to get away from this simple-minded stuff of, of nobody failing and nobody getting left behind. They have to learn that you have to put out effort to do it. Is there anything that you can do in that area? Because you're going to then get the benefit later from it. You know, one thing um, from an experience that is initially unrelated, but I think directly uh, germane to what you're saying, when I was in my first university presidency, we started a program for what they call kids at risk in an upstate New York community where kids from backgrounds where the parents had had no college education and in some cases no high school education were just not graduating. They just weren't making it through the pipeline at all. Um, there were a lot of things that made that program work, but the one thing that was, according to the federal reviewers, the most unusual was that we not only targeted the kids in, uh, in we really started in fourth grade uh, just for some financial reasons, we not only targeted those kids, we targeted their families. We had programming for the kid, for the family, things that made sure there was a network at home to help the teacher get the message across that working hard wasn't just sort of nonsense. But it also made the parent it also made the parent an ally, and, and the results were substantial along the way. But did you demand the same standards? Absolutely. These folks, these folks passed the same statewide regents exams at the end of the year that their peers were passing and that their predecessors had been failing. And so um, th there was very solid evidence, especially in the areas of reading capability and endurance and in mathematics capability that these kids grew. The irony was so did their parents. Uh, the schools in the area started seeing the parents who had no education getting their GEDs and going on to college when they thought, well, I was stupid. I couldn't do math in school, so I thought I was always stupid. The fact was they weren't stupid. They just really hadn't had the opportunity. But, but doing the whole, working on the whole family situation really helped um, and in fact, if they hadn't demanded the same results, um, it wouldn't have been as effective a program. I have about 10 questions and 10 minutes, so uh, short answers, please, and Okay, uh, and short Rick Schering, I'm going to make this fast because I know a lot of people want this microphone. Um, I'm going to give you a view from the trenches. Uh, in addition to my day job, um, one of the Constellation flight surgeons at NASA, uh, I teach a lot. And Barbara and I were talking about this at the reception. I mean, we teach on the weekends, we teach at night, we teach wherever we can because we have a passion for what we do, we love what we do. 
But one of the things I just threw out there is we need the freedom to do that. Like I said, it's weekends, it's at night. I'll be going to Scotland, uh, Doctor or uh, Mr. Abbey's program, the Scottish Space School. I mean, this is stuff you do in the free time. We're crunched with uh, the very few civil servants that we have to actually do the job because we have so many things going on. I, you know, this is one of our mission statements for NASA that we do education outreach. I think it should be just as much of a part of our daily job that we do this for those of us who are inclined and have a passion to do that as anything else. And if that means hiring more civil servants to, to have 10% of your day to be able to go and do outreach, fine. I mean, I don't mind going out on the weekends again teaching the kids because it's a blast. As far as the question about uh, the college students, we have... Uh, Great programs with aerospace medicine clerkships. We rotate medical students through. We have relationships with MIT. We get their students through. We have all kinds of stuff going on for those of us who want to teach, and it's it's great. I mean, you'd never get the opinion how great the the enthusiasm among the kids, the college age kids are from the media, but it's it's infectious out there. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of energy out there about space, and all it takes is one shot that you see a launch or something like that, and they're sold. So it gets back to just having the freedom to get out there and do that. And uh, I, I, my boss is over there. I know he's looking at me saying, how, I don't know how you get the opportunity to do this stuff, but you just make, make it. It would just be a lot more helpful. And I think as we start to you know, take advantage of what uh, uh, Barbara said about Dick Scobie, you know, if we motivate our children, everything's possible. Well, if we have a little bit more opportunity to do that, you know, then, then the sky is really the limit, no pun intended. But um, uh, anyway, I know Dave has something to say, and I uh, just want to leave it at that. Uh, just uh, open it up a little bit more for us, if this is a priority for NASA, to, to just let us do what we really love to do. Thanks. Possession of the mic yeah. is nine-tenths of the law. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love it. My comment is really quick. And yesterday we talked about the role of analogs. I think analogs are a perfect opportunity for education, and it's K through 12, right through to PhD postdoc level. In fact, the uh, the Pavilion Lake uh, CSA analog research site was voted one of the top 10 astrobiology research sites in the world last year. We have a PhD student who got the research on the cover of Nature magazine based on what was going on at Pavilion Lake. We've got NEMO missions and NEMO 9. We reached out to millions of kids throughout North America. And I think it's one of these things that we need to open the door to accessing these sites through funding and I think Charlie's point is really quite valid. We can look at these private sector launch opportunities and get educational components there, but by the same token, we need to put funding into supporting the analog sites. CSA will provide $25,000 funding to send students into these environments. You can get a lot of bang for your buck for 25000 with a graduate student. Thanks, Dave. A <laughs> couple of uh, quick comments. Uh, I'm Jim Vanderplu. One of the hats I wear is the Chief Medical Officer for Virgin Galactic. And uh, to tie into the previous speaker with uh, Glenn Lundy and the, the question about age, um, uh, the vast majority of Virgin Galactic employees are 20-somethings. My boss is 29 years old. I'm probably the oldest except for Richard Branson in the whole company, and he only beats me by about three months. Uh, so there's a lot of, of young, enthusiastic people coming up. Um, in the next three to four years, access to suborbital flight will occur every day. Um, there'll be several thousand people flying every year. But with each of those flights will be access for small experiments to be done. And my question for the panel is how do we um, prime that pathway for students to recognize those opportunities and uh, take advantage of, of what is coming in terms of commercial daily spaceflight opportunities. I, I actually think NASA historically has done a pretty good job making uh, parabolic flight opportunities available to students. And you know what, what better way to prepare for five or six minutes of weightlessness than to have tested your experiment out in parabolic flight. And, you know, zero G has educational opportunities. All of this costs money. I mean, that's, that's the big problem that we always run into. And, you know, NASA's student flights on the parabolic flights have, have had their ups and downs, so to speak, financially as, as well as uh, gravitationally. Uh, but I think the model is there. We know how to do it if we can afford it. Uh, Larry, uh, Larry Young, if there was ever pre preaching to the choir, we're the choir. 
and I'm proud to be part of it, but responding to what Kevin and, uh, and Bill Thompson said, we do have a challenge, and that is having these bright young people who want to get involved in the sort of research that we know is necessary identify themselves as members of the space life sciences discipline rather than as individuals in the subdisciplines who attend their own meetings. Do our, do our students who are doing research on cardiovascular deconditioning and countermeasures publish in heart or do they publish in aviation space and environmental medicine? Do they go to their American Heart Association meetings or do they go to aerospace me uh, medicine or gravitational bi biology? I think it's a challenge we face. I know Bill Thompson and I have talked about it a lot in terms of the graduate programs, but I believe that we need to go in, in every possible way encourage identification of space life sciences as a respectable self-standing discipline. Okay, uh, there, and then uh, get that mic over there, and then the gentleman in yellow. Since this is a summit on space medicine, I'd like to give you an example of uh, a role that can be played in medical schools. Uh, for a number of years, UTMB has had uh, courses uh, generously taught by uh, JSC uh, personnel on uh, space life sciences. With the opening of a flight uh, analog facility several years ago, we thought it was also important to acquaint medical students uh, with some of the challenges that uh, flight surgeons face uh, in supporting the program. Uh, and so we have instituted within our medical school curriculum uh, such, a, such a course. However, in the, in the preliminary discussions leading to that, uh, talking to, to NASA personnel, there was a concern expressed that we might be misleading medical students into thinking that they had real job opportunities to become flight surgeons. The argument that I countered with is that this is an educational problem, not just a career opportunity, and that the more that we were able to educate medical students, uh, residents, and, and physicians, about some of the challenges and the uniqueness of the problems in space medicine, the more we would have a cadre of people that could be consultants, collaborators, and expand upon that. Unfortunately, in contrast, in the, the graduate life sciences, decisions that were made several years ago has had a chilling effect on people being interested in doing comparable work in, in the space life sciences. Okay, that was a good comment. Uh, I'd like to give you a slightly different perspective as the aunt of a five year uh, of a of a twelve year old and a two year old, and as the daughter of two elementary school teachers. My experience is you can't start too young, and it doesn't take much, and hands on is what you need. Uh, in the discussion of web based education. Uh, Web-based education is wonderful, and it brings opportunities to people who wouldn't ordinarily have them. But five minutes of uh, watching how a heart beats in your hand or uh, being able to uh, participate directly in something made, makes an enormous impact. And unfortunately, uh, elementary school science, junior high school school science, high school science, those opportunities are being taken away. So I do research for NASA, I'm NASA funded, I'm at a national laboratory, I have access to a fine university down the hill from my laboratory in Berkeley. And having students come up and participate in my uh, analog environment, if you will, which is my laboratory, is a tremendous opportunity, but it shouldn't just be uh, at the university level. If you get the five-year-olds engaged, they remember. They remember. That's it for me. Uh, I mean, I just, just actually want to skip back to a point is, is that I think that, that uh, space medicine and life sciences can be used at all levels. It's extremely versatile. But at the university level, you know, I, I've taught a course for 10 years in space medicine in the UK where everybody is under no illusions that they're not going to have anything to do with the space program, most likely. But the way that we've taught it is a boundary condition physiology course. So we teach it alongside high altitude and thermal extremes. And, you know, they think they're learning about astronauts and polar explorers and mountaineers, and actually they're learning about basic physiology. And when we see them later on the wards, they are not the people who are calling us because they didn't understand physiology. They're, they're calling us because they understand the patient's sick. Uh, it's extremely valuable. So I think that independently whether or not they have the specific career opportunities, it has a value separately from that. Thank you. 
Yeah, the, the other issue is uh, the other, other generation, other age of graduate students and actually professionals and scientists that want to work in the life sciences. And we have a particular experience in the space radiation community. One of my uh, more uh, you know, proud uh, <clears throat> milestones in my career was to be part of the NASA Space Radiation Summer School at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And there we have the opportunity to use a national asset like an international space station and combine theoretical, practical, and hands-on experiments. We were able to create kind of new generation of scientists and young students, and this was an extraordinary experience. So don't forget those graduate students that need to be motivated and need to have some opportunity to learn about the, the science, but also even senior scientists that need to move in the new areas, and they have no idea what is out there. Space radiation is one, one example, one of the analogs, and how you can move forward with those uh, educational opportunities. Just to mention that. Thank you. Where is the other mic? Uh, George? Uh, <coughs> Mike? Yeah, carry on with your question then. Um. I was wondering, uh, wanted to follow up on your Google idea that the, most of these people at Google, when they, certainly when they started out, were quite young. And if it's not this gray hair syndrome that, that um, we get in the way of things and that, that the Apollo program could do so much because people were, were so much younger, I wonder what would happen if there were a lean and mean young team assembled at NASA and you had, you had hiring exclusively for people under 35 to lead this team with very minimal oversight and the older people just protected them from outside controls and allowed them to tackle a specific problem and you had a hundred young men and women doing that and just leave them alone and protect them I bet you'd have magical things done actually from from time to time NASA has had special projects where you 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 maybe maybe you don't get people specifically hired but I, you know I think the things that, that the NASA engineers love more than anything else is is to be able to do real engineering and to get special projects assigned to them, um, it, you know, that, that's what really brings the, the reward for doing their job. George? I think uh, Bonnie mentioned uh, the uh, National Academy report uh, rising above the gathering storm. And I would uh, commend that to you to really look at that report because it really clearly identifies the problem and uh, comes up with uh, some recommendations on how you can fix the problem. But the problem goes beyond, you're talking about young people getting them interested in uh, NASA and that kind of activity, but the problem really gets back to uh, much younger children. If you look at uh, the city of Houston, uh, we have the third largest school district in the United States of America. We graduate less than 50% of the students from high school. In the state of Texas, we graduate less than 50% of the students from, a, uh, from our high schools, let alone go on to college. So, you know, we need have a problem, we need to address it at a younger age, and we need to also ensure that we've got teachers, uh, give the background to the teachers so they can really get the young people interested in science and engineering and mathematics. So it's a problem not only for the students and the young people, but it's a problem relative to the teachers as well. And we need to recognize that and look at how we can really uh, in incentivize the teachers and uh, pay them the money that uh, we should pay them and recognize the responsibilities and the duties they have. So this problem is not just uh, the issues we've been talking here today. It's a massive problem that uh, is going to take us all working very hard to try and solve. Thank you for that comment. Okay, I have time for two more, and those are the two. <coughs> No, uh, I really enjoyed this this discussion. I, I wanted. To, my name is Gil Castro, and in SBRI, and I uh, support the you know, the advisory group for uh, education. <coughs> and uh, I'm a career scientist, but uh, retired and do work now in, in public schools. Public schools that uh, I've been working with, and these are whole school districts for the past few years. They all have a something they call a portrait of a graduate. And they list as teachers, and these are administrators, list characteristics of these graduates. 
and uh, their academic skills that they want these to uh, impart to the students and their, their non-academic professional skills, interpersonal skills. And the academic skills only make up about 10% of the traits and the rest are, are other traits that relate to professionalism, to the interpersonal skills. And uh, yesterday, uh, I think it was David Williams said that, uh, you know, we've, we've got to tell the story. We've got to get the story out to get support for these uh, international programs, the space flight programs. And I would I'd like to just submit that uh, when you tell the story about the International Space Station or the International Space Medicine Summit or NASA, it goes well beyond uh, engineering, science, and math. And it brings in a lot of these traits that teachers are trying to impart to students but they're not measurable, they're not easily measurable. And uh, especially in Texas, where you look at Texas assessment of knowledge and skills, where they can be quantitated on their math skills. It's the other skills that, that are equally important. And I just want to underscore the point that was made from the back of the room earlier about uh, NASA partnering with uh, other organizations like the Department of Education to put together some type of program that is equivalent to what Bonnie Dunbar was talking about early on, and uh, this was the uh, National Education, uh, National Defense Education Act, and this is something that James Baker talked about last night. It was part of the legislation that created NASA. It also created this this act that these fellowships and uh, scholarships were part of that act. And Bonnie mentioned that she was uh, a recipient of one of these. But uh, but again, I'd like to say that the story goes well beyond engineering. It goes well beyond science, and it goes well beyond mathematics. That is the, the story that's associated with the international space medicine. Thank you. The challenge, the challenge is to educators to take risk and do things that are different than have been done in the past. I think there's one other challenge that we need to keep in mind, and it, it, it's in Every comment that I've heard in the last four years or five years of people worried about um, the lack of STEM education in the lower grades. That's a huge problem. We've got to work on it. But we've also got to work on the prejudice that somebody who didn't get it and is now in their 30s and is frustrated and wish they had done something else is beyond getting educated. These people are an enormous group of now more mature people willing to work and maybe there is something to this theory that you can't become a genius in math if you don't know it before 30, but you can learn a lot of math after 30. And I think, I think we need to not forget those because the parents who have gone to school and done well don't very often have kids who don't get through school. And so if we let both of these generations get away, then we're really behind the eight ball. Last, last question, comment? Yes, I'm <coughs> I'm the last person. Is this on? I don't believe it is. Okay. No. Uh, no. I, I am it's not on. Uh, you are not on. 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 I have to do a little defense of NASA here. Is it on now? No. no. <laughs> And do a little defense of NASA here. Uh, first, I don't know what the NASA budget is for K through 12 education, but when I was working with it a couple of years ago, it was a half a million dollars. And I get back to what Charlie said: a half a million dollars for K through 12 education is not even a drop in the budget in this country. NASA is probably not going to put a lot more money into that, but it has tried really hard to inspire students in STEM education and. I think, you know, working with the folks in the education area, they are trying everything under, their sun, under the sun to do this in K through 12. And uh, at the college level, we talked about the parabolic flight uh, program. We talked about all the interns that are going to be at Johnson Space Center this summer. I think there's about 400 undergraduates that are going to come into our center this summer. Most of them are funded. These are not volunteers. So NASA just put a lot of money into just Johnson Space Center and all the other centers are doing this. I have visited with Kennedy and I have visited with Ames and they do a tremendous amount of working with teachers and with students. 
So I think the agency is probably doing the best they can with the financial resources. The scientists, all the scientists I worked with on life sciences missions went into the classrooms and had students doing parallel projects. Uh, so there's a lot that's going on. Um, but the problem is enormous. And I get a chance to get out and visit in universities, whether it's Texas Women's University and Denton to uh, the big universities that we have around here. And they're all doing K through 12. Rick Barrera's laboratory right here at Rice is doing K through 12. There's an enormous amount that's going on in this country. I do think NASA would be uh, well served by uh, working with the Department of Education. There is some of that that does go on. But this is an enormous problem, like George said. I think NASA is trying its best given the resources and the fact that, you know, our primary business isn't education. And, and I think, if, you know, we all have to do it. And I think, as I said, every university in this country is trying to work K through 12 because it's such an enormous American problem. And we are all working on this, and it's just going to take a lot of effort from a lot of people. But NASA does fund K through 12 education does fund undergraduates and does fund senior design projects through the, the uh, state uh, space grant consortium. So there is a lot going on there. And maybe uh, some of you need to get on the education website and you will see all of those programs. Thanks. Let, let me just make one comment. I'm, I'm another hat I wear as director of the Massachusetts Space Grant. Uh, we're very constrained in our ability to support K through 12 education and I get the sense from hearing explanations of this that there seems to be some sort of a bureaucratic sensitivity between NASA education and the Department of Education so you know your your remark that that these need to be coordinated couldn't I mean it's it's right on the mark it there's just no excuse given the enormity of the problem for, for letting the bureaucracy interfere with that. But I, I think there clearly is this sensitivity of what NASA education sh uh, should and should not be doing. Well, thank you um, very much, uh, <coughs> Jeff. This is uh, time to summarize. I apologize for those people who've had their hands up and who are frustrated because they haven't been able to um, uh, get their points in. We we had so many good points uh, raised, there wasn't time to do all of that. However, I do note there are some discussion groups coming up, and I'm sure that the uh, education one would be most happy for you to come in and, um, <coughs> and uh, put input. It, it strikes me, as I've listened to all of these various comments dealing with the whole age range of activities, the stimulation, the employer, and so on, that a service that could be well fulfilled by a group like this is to somehow collect these ideas together in a, a structured way and then work with the education institutes or responsible uh, departments in their various countries because the problems are different for um, different countries uh, or with the industry in their country but if we, if we in this international forum can somehow put together this collectivity of concerns and ideas that could make things better, that would be a useful um, ground document to um, go further with. With that, I'd like to thank my panel for the excellent contribution they made, and to you, uh, the uh, participants, for stimulating us even further. Thank you so much.